Thank you, Esther. That was absolutely brilliant. It's wonderful to have you here. And thank you. Thank you to all of you for coming here from right across our country. But can I begin with this? By addressing those of you, my friends, my neighbours, my constituents here in Newark. Some of you I last saw on election day when we were pounding those pavements. Thank you for everything that you did. Thank you for knocking on all those doors, for having those conversations. Thank you for posting those leaflets through letterboxes so beautifully. As a result of everything that you did, we defeated Labour. We squeezed reform. We defied the polls, the odds, the national tide. And we won here in Newark. <laughs> and so, and so it is fitting that I am here today in the town and with the people to whom I owe so much to launch my campaign to be the next leader of the Conservative Party. And I've spent my whole life here in the Midlands, living in small towns like Newark. And these places and these people, people like you, like me, have shaped my politics. People in Newark are hardworking. They are doers. They are makers. They are people who get up early in the morning to earn a living. They are proud of our history. They would never denigrate our country. They treasure family and do everything in their power to look after their children and give them the best possible start in life. They embody the best values of our country. I'm in politics for that, for them, for you. It's why, it's why, as I wrote last month, in response to those people who said that we should cut out the members of our party in this process of choosing the next leader of the Conservative Party, that no, we should never do that. I want to breathe new life into our party with a new spirit in which we respect the role of the membership of this party. And we'll do that in many ways. We'll do it, for example, by ensuring that it's members who choose candidates for elections once again. I want, I want to grow this party. I want to become a mass membership organization once again, with new members of all ages and in every part of our country. And I know we can do it. In 2010, the Conservative Party won young people. And I believe, I firmly believe, that with the right approach, we can persuade young people again that it is in their interest to be conservatives. You know, there are too many young people today for whom the dream of home ownership feels out of reach. They're sat at home in their childhood bedrooms, waiting to get on in life, waiting for their lives to begin. And we conservatives have to change that. That is one of the reasons why I'm so proud to look around this room today and to see so many young conservatives here for a reason, because they are backing this campaign. Now, we need to get the machine of the Conservative Party back into fighting shape because it let too many people down, members and candidates at the last general election. And I'd like to take this opportunity to say and to pay tribute to those Conservative MPs who fought at the last election, who lost their seats due to no fault of their own, decent public servants who worked for years to support their communities. We must never let this happen again. We must be better. We can be better. <laughs> now, we've got elections coming up. There'll be local elections next year. Then there'll be Scottish and Welsh elections. Even the general election is only a matter of years away. We've got to get this party back together. That is why we're here today, to get the party back together and to get going again. I know we can do it. But let's not be too downbeat. It's only a few weeks into this new Labour government, and already 
the hard left of the Labour Party have got it in for Sir Keir Starmer. There's a cabal of rebel Labour MPs and independents who are already gunning for Sir Keir. And of course, amongst them is one MP for Islington, who is publicly seething that Sir Keir has waltzed into number 10 without giving them so much as a thought. But let's not waste too much time worrying about poor Emily Thornbury. <laughs> but seriously, seriously, in this campaign, I am going to tell you some hard truths. But let me begin with this. This is a great country with a proud history. When we came into office 13 years ago, the Labour Party had left this country's public finances in the worst possible state. And we turned them around <coughs> thanks to the decisions taken by David Cameron. We reformed our schools such that today our children are the most literate and the most numerate in the Western world. We empowered head teachers against huge bureaucratic resistance to take the decisions that were necessary to put the interests of their students first. We created free schools, and I founded one myself here in Newark. And despite the backing of Sir Keir Starmer, we ensured that Jeremy Corbyn, a threat to our prosperity and national security, was never prime minister of this country. We stood, by, we stood by brave Ukraine in their hour of greatest need. We did that as conservatives. And we did more than that. Thanks to Boris Johnson, despite all the opposition and the paralysis, we got Brexit done. Yeah. Now, now all of this, all of this begs a big question. How is it? that we have just suffered our worst ever electoral defeat. And to answer that question, we do need to confront some hard truths. There's many reasons, but the principal one, the primary one, is that we broke our promise to the British public to deliver controlled and reduced migration and the secure border that the public rightly demand. We allowed the cycle of broken promises to continue. And as a minister, when I concluded that I couldn't secure any more changes to our legal migration system, I resigned from Cabinet last year because I, for one, was not willing to be just another minister who makes and breaks promises on immigration. But, but it was about more than just that. Let's acknowledge that today. In 2019, we also promised a strong economy and NHS. But growth was too low and taxes were too high. And we lost our hard-won reputation for sound financial management. And we must never do that again. We promised to level up and we got started on that generational mission, aided by great conservative mayors like Andy Street and Ben Houchen. But we were knocked off course by the pandemic and by global economic crises. But I believe more passionately than ever that talent is spread evenly across our great country, but opportunity is not. And we must return to that agenda. And, and critically, despite spending more money than ever before, too much of the British state simply wasn't working. Nowhere exemplifies this challenge more than the NHS. We are spending 20% more money. There are 20% more doctors and nurses in the NHS than there were five years ago and yet we are treating no more patients. We've poured cash into the black hole of waste and inefficiency. We allowed new quangos to arise. 
We allowed poor management to go unpunished. We saw some of the structural flaws in the system ourselves. But out of fear of our opponents mischaracterizing our efforts, we shirked the difficult decisions. We allowed the lions on the front line of the NHS to be let down by the donkeys in the back offices. <laughs> above all, above all, we forgot that the NHS is a public service, not a religion. So if we are in office again, if we re-enter government, we must never make those, those choices again. We must never shirk the difficult decisions. We must never jump at our own shadows. We must invest in the NHS, but we must ensure it works for the British people. <laughs> now, Labour. Now, Labour say all these problems are the fault of the Tories. Of course they're not. They're definitely not. These challenges didn't arise in 2010, and they're not going to magically disappear in 2024. The roots of these problems are not red or blue. These are challenges faced by most countries across the West. Their roots are in geopolitics, in new technology, in the battle of ideologies. But one thing I do firmly believe is this. The particular problems we face as a country stem from the fact that the British system is not working for the British people. <laughs> and I'm not going to lie to you. For most of my time as a politician, I believed our political system basically worked. I was elected 10 years ago in a by-election here in Newark. I was honoured to be a member of the government of each of the last five Conservative Prime Ministers. I prided myself on making the system work, on getting things done for my constituents and our country. I was the housing secretary who, along with Esther McVeigh, ensured that the number of new homes being built in our country was the highest level for 40 years. We slashed red tape on small businesses. We got investment again on our high streets and in left behind communities the length and breadth of the United Kingdom. I created the world's most admired homelessness program to try to eliminate rough sleeping. But in the last two years, I have come to see that a different approach is needed. As community secretary during the pandemic, I saw the British state was both overbearing and powerless. As housing secretary, I saw that we had a planning system that meant that we couldn't get the critical infrastructure in energy or transport built, even if it was overwhelmingly in the national interest to do so. And at the Home Office, I saw more strongly than ever what was going wrong in our country. I saw that the British state was either unwilling or unable to perform its most basic duty to secure our borders and to keep the British people safe. As Minister for Immigration, I saw dangerous people coming into our country and the state unable to deport them. I saw the British state finding it difficult to build united and cohesive communities. I saw intercommunal violence, extremism. I saw challenges of diminishing public trust. I saw an economic model that was fundamentally failing, whereby imported foreign labour was leading to immense pressures on our housing, on public services that our constituents wanted, like access to GPs and dentists. And I saw British workers' wages being undercut. Look, if mass migration was rocket fuel for our economy, we would have just lived through the greatest age of economic growth. But we haven't. And too many intelligent people refused to say it like it was. Too many economists were more worried about GDP than GDP per capita. Now, I fought relentlessly for the solutions to these problems, solutions that most 
people agree with. And yet our political system was either unwilling or unable to effect the change that our country needs. And in the end, I concluded this, that the system that I had been part of, that I had upheld, was completely broken and was contributing to our national decline. Now, Labour are in power. They have the landslide that is necessary to effect the radical changes that our country needs. But it's not going to happen. They have too many delusions. If anyone tells you that the grown-ups are in charge, just look at Ed Miliband. <laughs> Even in the last couple of weeks, as you just heard from Esther, <coughs> Labour have been dishonest. They've lied about the state of our public finances. They've begun to break their promises made to you, the British public, not to raise your taxes. They've declined to set a timetable to increase defence spending. They've created housing targets whereby we build less in our cities, precisely the places where homes are needed the most and the greatest productivity benefits could be achieved. They've, they've released thousands of dangerous criminals from our prisons. And on the altar of net zero, they've compromised hundreds of thousands of jobs in our oil and gas industry. And already, the starting pistol has been fired by the far left of the Labour Party. They are gunning for Keir Starmer. And these people, remember, these are people who despise the West, who disdain British culture and history. These are people who deny basic biology and common sense, and who dogmatically oppose everything that we conservatives hold dear opportunity, freedom, self-reliance, free enterprise. It's for all those reasons and more that our party remains our country's best hope. <laughs> but our party has to change. We have to acknowledge that. It's got to change. The shape of that change and the principles and values that we must stand for are already becoming clear. I believe that the British people and removed, you should be detained and removed within days. I believe. I believe that we should be building more prisons and that we should be locking up more serial offenders not releasing people. I believe, I believe that we can and we must make our economy grow faster. And unlike Labour, we do this by building more homes in our cities. We do it by having more reliable, cheap energy produced in the UK. And we do that by reducing subsidies for offshore wind and investing in new nuclear. I believe that we give our people better skills, real skills, not low-value degrees. And whilst I believe in a safety net, there are too many people on welfare in our country, and we need to give them the dignity that comes with work. I believe things are growing stronger, and we must respond to that. We respond to that by investing more in our armed forces, by investing at least 3% of GDP in defence, and doing so more intelligently than we have in the past. <laughs> above all, above all, as a conservative to my core, I believe this. I believe in a small state that works, not a big state that fails. <laughs> now, friends, our victory here in Newark a few weeks ago tells us a lesson. Each of those MRP polls that said we were going to lose, all the pundits and the commentators who said it was impossible to win here, they were wrong. They got it wrong. We won. And those same pundits, those same pollsters and talking heads down in Westminster, 
they now say that our party cannot win again. They say that our problems are too intractable. They say we're too divided. They say that Keir Starmer is destined to be our nation's prime minister for a decade or more. Well, if there's one lesson of our success here in Newark, it's this. Nothing in politics is certain. Just as there are no final victories, there are no final defeats. And each and every one of you is testament to that. Those of you who helped in my campaign, who put their heart and soul into it, who fought for this community, for our party, for our nation, knows to your core that we can do this. So enough of defeatism, we can win. And just as we, just as it would be wrong to have the drag anchor of defeatism, so we must also be grounded in realism. And we all know in our hearts that we have a mountain to climb. We lost millions of votes. We lost millions of votes on the left to the Labour Party and the Lib Dems. We lost millions on the right to reform, trust, Hard won is easily lost. And it takes time, it takes energy, it takes commitment to win it back. But we must do that. Our party has to change a lot. Otherwise, there is no future for us. If we do change, let's change in keeping with our best traditions and values, which include generosity of spirit, respect for institutions and one another, a preference, a desire, a deep yearning for national unity, not division. We can ensure that those best traditions endure. And if we do change, if we listen to the British people, if we show that we have listened, if we show that we understand that we made mistakes and we've learned from those mistakes, if we show that we understand the challenges facing our country and that uniquely we have the serious answers and the serious leadership to stand up to them. If we show that we are united again as a broad church, but a broad church with a common creed. If above all else, we show that we have changed, then we can win again. And, and we can and will win again, not in 10 years, not in two terms, but we can win the next general election. That, that my friends, that my friends is why I am standing to be the next leader of the Conservative Party, to change our party, to win the next general election, and to secure the future of our country. Change, win, deliver for the people of Great Britain. I would be honored if you would come with me on that journey. I would be honored if you would join my campaign.